Here's what's coming up in episode 178, J. Allen Cross. When we talk about brujería, we're talking about Mexican witchcraft is specifically what brujería is. Our team is, is very unique in the way that most of us are psychics and that's how we work together in tandem. So there will be two to four of us that show up at a house. We then, without speaking to each other, do our walkthrough where we all kind of head off in different directions, feel out the house, make our notes. And then we sit down in front of the client and then tell each other what we felt. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance hey y'all i hope you're enjoying this holiday season no matter what it looks like even if it looks a little different this year like mine does and please stay safe and stay healthy hey i want to tell you where i learned about today's guest j allen cross i heard about it from my sister-in-law who happened to hear his interview on a show called Ask a Hag, and she sent me a link. First of all, I think it's a show that many of you would like, so you might want to check it out. It's called Ask a Hag. But in their interview with Joshua, that's J. Allen Cross's first name, he gave a shout out to the big seance and my first interview with my buddy Marilyn Painter. And it was actually episode one from six and a half years ago. I reached out to him and I said, you've got to come on my show. And he said, yes. So here we go. J. Allen Cross is a practicing witch of Mexican, Native American, and European descent whose craft was shaped by his Catholic upbringing and mixed family culture. Living in his home state of Oregon, he works as a psychic medium and occult specialist for a well-known paranormal investigation team out of the Portland metro area. When he's not investigating... He enjoys providing spells and potions to his local community, exploring haunted and abandoned places, working as a consultant for other workers and investigators, and of course, writing about witchcraft. You can follow him on Instagram at Oregon underscore wood underscore witch. And he also has a book coming out, and I should have mentioned this the first thing, but that's okay. American Brujeria, Modern Mexican American Folk Magic, and it is coming in May. And I'm fascinated by even just the topic and the description, which I'm going to read, and so I can't wait until this comes out. Here's the description from Amazon. A practical, hands-on guide to Mexican-American folk magic or brujeria, American brujeria is about the fascinating blend of American and Mexican folk magic currently used by those living in the U.S., but whose roots are steeped in Mexican culture. This type of Mexican-American folk magic, which the author calls American brujeria, features its own unique saints and spirits, as well as familiar ones such as the infamous Santa Muerte. American brujeria includes stories from Mexico, folk saints, the story of Guadalupe, the influence of Catholicism, the art of limpias, traditional folk healing methods, spell casting, oil crafting, praying the rosary in English and Spanish, making an altar to Guadalupe, using novena candle magic, making protective charms from saints, medals, and more. 
There's even a whole section on creative uses for Vicks VapoRub, a staple <laughs> in Mexican-American folk healing. American Brujeria is extremely close to conjure traditions of the American South and, in fact, shares a lot of crossover, demonstrating how these traditions have influenced one another. Oh, my gosh. Welcome to the parlor, Joshua. So, J. Allen Cross is actually Joshua. So, welcome to the parlor, sir. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Awesome. I'm so excited to introduce this topic. I've, I've told you already that uh, once I saw this out there, I was like, yep, it's time and we need us some of this. I was introduced to you from the Ask a Hag podcast. I think you were on there in October. My sister-in-law had heard your interview and shared it with me. And I was like, yep, definitely reaching out to J. Allen Cross. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so excited that you reached out to me. I was actually um, kind of surprised when you did, but I've been a big fan of the show. So uh, having you reach out to me, it was it, it was a very obvious yes right out of the gate. When my sister-in-law had mentioned it, she sent it to me because, first of all, I did not know my sister-in-law was that into that type of podcast. And so that was cool. I was like, shut up. And she <laughs> told me to go to a certain timestamp and you had actually... Uh, brought up an episode of our podcast in that interview of my buddy, Marilyn Painter. And so that was just, I was like, yep, he's meant to be on the podcast. <laughs> and how have I not heard of Jay Allen Cross? What's up with that? Is yes, that episode in particular was actually very impactful for me because she spoke about something that I had already sort of kind of come across or noticed as far as the agreements with entities are concerned. And somebody on my paranormal team actually had channeled a very similar message from their guides. But that episode filled in a lot of the blanks for me as, as far as how it all works. And it makes a lot of sense. And it's something I've seen over and over again in paranormal work. We definitely, the child from first sight, I could feel it. It was something, you can feel the difference in an energy from a child's energy of bright and light to there was something very, very heavy just in the presence of the child. So immediately you could feel it. So we did what we needed to do. We raised the vibration and, you know, we tried to talk to the spirit. He talked in a different voice. The voice was somewhat altered, but not to the extent as you would see in a, you know, kind of Hollywood movie where it's very exaggerated, but it was definitely not within the tone of voice of the natural voice of the child. Then when we thought that, you know, he came to, he settled down, we could start seeing the color. His, his color in his face was very pale. It felt like the, the child's soul itself was set aside. The coloring was drained. The emotions were gone. There was no feeling of emotions um, that I could scan in the body. But then kind of based on, you know, part of it is there needs to be an agreement. And we got to the point that the energy, whether it's called an entity or a demon, um, you know, it's all just a label. <laughs> so really what it is, it's a negative energy that was around the child it, the child somehow allowed it to come in through some sort of agreement and has allowed it to enter into the household with him. And after we did what we needed to do um, at the very end, the color started coming back a little bit. But then the child went around to the family members and shook their hands. And it was really odd. He, he, he walked to each one and held their hands and looked them in the eye. Wow. And he skipped me, but went around to all others. And the family's like, oh, he's saying, you know, I'm sorry for all of this. I'm now me. You know, when you think when someone holds your hand and looks you in the eye, it feels nice or mm -hmm. okay. But he looked at me and skipped me. Then I left because it was really late at night. Um, and what happened after I left, the child, you know, reached a point that, was trying to burn himself in fire after I left, things escalated really bad. 
So the very next day they brought him back to me and we were going to do it all over again. And even with more energy. And the mother said that he said that the person possessing him was asked, shook their hand for their agreement for her to stay. It was a female that was within him. That's what the shaking of the hands were an agreement to stay. The parents didn't understand the agreement or what they were agreeing to. But holding of hands and eye contact is a form of agreement, of a letting in. And um, so that gave it permission to stay and come back again. I love that. And I'm glad that was really helpful and useful, especially since that was my very first episode. And I was so not in the know of so many things and even about podcasting. (laughs) And so I'm glad that that first episode is connecting to people. And I love, I love my buddy Marilyn. And so it might be time to get Marilyn back on here because it's been forever since Marilyn has been on the show. You know, as I've told you, I am so very uneducated when it comes to Mexican or Mexican-American culture. So it won't be difficult to find things to talk about and teach us today. And also just when I did a Google search on Brujeria today, it was like, whoa. And right off the bat, though, it didn't seem like I was seeing a lot of positive or glowing articles or videos. And some of it seemed dark and I was seeing things that were very fear based. And so from right off the bat, I wanted you to tell us, you know, first of all, just what it is, obviously, but then maybe some of the misconceptions that we need to clear up right from the top. Definitely. So when we talk about brujeria, we're talking about Mexican witchcraft is specifically what brujeria is. And when we talk about things like witchcraft or when we use the word witchcraft, witchcraft is an English word. And so when we say witchcraft, we're automatically talking about English magic, English, you know, witchcraft inherently. So people think that brujeria is like Wicca in Mexico, but that's, that's not <laughs> how it works at all. It's, it's an entirely different beast. And you're right. A lot of the times it's not looked upon very favorably because brujeria is known traditionally to be very destructive. People are very afraid of brujas and brujos um, because, you know, in Spanish, you change the ending of the words based on whether or not they're male or female. Um, in the United States, we'll use terms like brujix with an X for um, non-binary ways of talking about it. But in Mexico, we would use the bruja or brujo. And brujeria is seen very much as a destructive art a lot of the time. There's a lot of fear around it. And the thing is, is that it's not unfounded. Brujeria is very, very powerful. And so when you become the target of a bruja or brujo's wrath, it can be really, really terrifying. And there are stories that even in researching this book that we're still hearing today of people who are like, no, I've seen someone fly, like actually fly or transform into an owl or a jaguar. These magics in Mexico are still very, very real. And so there's a lot of superstition around how to defend against it, um, things you should and shouldn't do. In part of the book that I was researching, I spoke to a friend whose parents are from Guanajuato in Mexico. And she was talking about visiting there and how you are not supposed to be around or go near cats at night because it is said that at night, brujas will steal the eyes from cats so that they can see while they fly through the trees. And in their place, the brujas put their own eyes into the cat. So if the cat sees you, then the bruja can see you as well. And so there's a lot of distrust. There's a lot of darkness surrounding brujeria, which is why in the book, I'm so very clear to differentiate between what I'm calling American brujeria and real traditional Mexican countryside brujeria. They're very different beasts. Because in Mexico, we have several different types of magic. And brujeria is the one that's most known, the most talked about, the most feared. Um, so it's, it's the one that we, we speak about the most. We also have things like curanderismo, which is um, the Mexican folk healing. It's very much Catholic based. And it's still a lot of the traditions and techniques and things like that in curanderismo is something that we would call in the United States magic or you know some form of witchcraft. But it's not seen that way over there. 
And then we also have something called hechicería, which is sorcery, which is kind of somewhere in between. It's, it's not this terrifying thing that brujería is, but at the same time, it's not just healing and light and things like that that curanderismo is. And so when we're talking about American brujería, it's actually a lot closer to hechicería. But in the United States, Latino folks often refer to their magic as brujería just simply because that's the translated word for witchcraft, which we're trying to sort of reclaim in the United States. So that's why I wanted to differentiate the book as being American Brujeria, because what we're doing here in this work that I'm talking about, where we're doing, um, you know, lighting candles to saints, doing limpias, which is like a, a spiritual cleansing to take off like hexes or sickness or things like that. All, all of that sort of work is closer to Hechicería, but we still call it Brujeria in the United States, which is kind of where the confusing part comes in. So you have to differentiate between what we're calling brujería in the States versus what they're calling brujería in Mexico. Because in the United States, if you tell someone like, oh, I'm a brujo, that simply means that I am a person who is Latinx and I practice a Latinx form of magic. Whereas if you go to Mexico and you say, I'm a brujo, people will literally run away from you (laughs) because you have just told them that I fly through the night and eat babies. So neat. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so it takes it takes a little finesse. And that's something that I spend pretty much the first chapter of my book talking about is kind of being like, okay, let's dissect this real quick. Because brujeria is still very, very real in Mexico. And so the idea that, you know, brujeria is just, you know, lighting some candles or whatever, it's completely incorrect. Brujeria is this really intense and very secretive magic that very few people get to learn because it is so powerful. Is it a religious practice? Um, not that I know of, because again, it's, it's very secretive. In order to mm-hmm. actually learn real brujería, you have to go to Mexico, speak Spanish fluently, and also find someone who is a real deal person. Um, as far as I know, it is not. Most witchcraft is actually removed from uh, religion entirely. A lot of people do blend the two, but they are separate practices. What does your practice look like? You know, what what does it mean for you? Yeah, so my practice in what I do with my kind of Mexican folk magic, it revolves a lot around Guadalupe. She is a big central pillar in this kind of Mexican folk magic as sort of a, a goddess type figure. Some people are very upset by calling it a goddess because we have to understand that we are working somewhere between indigenous practices and then the Catholic Church. So Guadalupe is kind of a, a, a weird beast in the way that she is both Mary, mother of God, but at the same time, she's also Tonantzin, which is an old Mexican goddess of the earth. And she's very, very powerful. And so when Guadalupe showed up in Mexico in the 1500s, The Spanish who were there and the indigenous population there saw two very different things. The Spanish were like, oh, that's Mary. We know her. We're down with her. Sure. Like you can hang out with her. But then the native people saw a lot of their symbols in her. She was she looked like them. She was kind of their color in. She she looked like us. She had the dark hair, the dark skin, things like that, that they had really come to know as one of them. She spoke their language. She had a lot of their symbols in her image. So uh, like the black sash that she wears around is a native symbol to show that she's pregnant. A lot of the uh, printing on her dress is also native symbols, as well as the moon and the sun that are around her. So there's a lot of arguing that happens between, you know, people who are very much on the indigenous side who are angry if you say that Guadalupe is Mary at all. But then her entire veneration is done through, you know, praying the rosary, which is a very Marian thing. And her image is very Marian. So she is this blended creature of both kind of Mary and Aztec mother earth goddess, which is something that we have to get used to because a lot of this work is blending things that are, you know, considered witchcraft and Catholicism. And that's something that really confuses a lot of people. But in our culture, they go together very, very well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So a lot of it, you know, kind of revolves around working with Guadalupe, um, working with the saints, which is another thing that really confuses people, too, because when I say that I work with Catholic saints, 
I mean, I work with Catholic saints. A lot of the times when I say, oh, you know, I work with this saint, people think it's like Santeria where it's actually a different spirit, but I'm just calling it Saint so-and-so. But in our work, it is the actual Catholic saints that we're calling upon, which again, confuses people because they don't believe that this type of work in Catholicism should go hand in hand, but it really does. So a lot of my work is working with these spirits, these kind of Holy Spirits, God, Guadalupe, the saints. Um, It's a lot of healing work where uh, if people come to me and they have, or they feel like they've been cursed, we can do divination, find out if they have, and then we can do um, what we call Olympia, which is a, a cleansing to remove the curse or the hex, or even sometimes people just get bad luck or a bad spirit will attach to them. So it's a lot of this work. So the American brujeria that I do is kind of a mashup of, you know, traditional brujeria, hechiceria, and curanderismo is the kind of three that end up blending together and then making a new beast here in the United States. So it's a very, it's a very spiritual thing as opposed to religious. Yes. Yeah. One thing from hearing your interview on Ask a Hag is you talked a lot about demons and agreements, which the agreements is what you mentioned you had heard from Marilyn on my episode one. And I've been very open on the show about uh, being skeptic of, you know, the concept of, of demons as, as entities. So Tell me why I'm wrong to be skeptical of demons and agreements that you can get yourself involved in. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I I don't think that you are inherently wrong to be skeptical. I think it, it is important to be skeptical about a lot of these things. There is a difference, though, between being skeptical and blindly rejecting something outright. Because... I think it's healthy to be skeptical, but in the work that I do, I see this a lot where people mess around with something, whether it's a Ouija board or they start dabbling in witchcraft or the occult, or sometimes they just open the wrong closet at work or school or something. Um, But these things very much do exist. And it's something that I have spent the last 15 years working with and trying to help people who are affected by them. Being skeptical is is healthy, but we have to understand that the other side, too, is full of all kinds of things. And so there's this limited belief that the only thing on the other side is, you know, angels, demons and God or, or something to that effect. It's people think it's very narrow. There's only a handful of things over there. But what I have found through this work is that there is a whole menagerie of creatures on the other side that it's impossible to really tag them and put them into groups and say, these are these ones and these are those ones. It's um, so when we come across things like the word demons, that's going to mean very different things depending on who you say it to kind of like the word, bruja, right? So when I'm talking about demons, we have to realize that people will mean kind of one of two things when they talk about them. They'll either mean like biblical demons, you know, those who were cast out of heaven right. down onto the earth, you know, the Beelzebubs of the world and whatnot. Exorcist. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, the bazoozoos or whatever. Yeah. But then on the other end, we have kind of what uh, what paranormal investigation TV shows call quote unquote demons, which in my line of work, I have found those things to be very different. And so what I would what most people would call a, you know, a demon, I tend to refer to as a negative entity, which is just a predator on the other side. And Are they evil? Maybe. I'm not sure. I'm not here to judge that myself. That's not my job. But from the fly's point of view, the spider is very much evil, right? Mm -hmm. So this, these things on the other side that are feeding off of people or attaching to people or, or haunting them and making their lives miserable in one way or another, it's just simply their job. It's their function. It's how they work. I don't know why they work that way, but it's just what they're here to do. So in my line of work, these are the things that I end up dealing with. These are the things that I find people making agreements with the most. And it's something that is actually not as uncommon as people really think. Uh, A lot of the times people think that this is something that only happens in the movies or in really scary stories. Or if it does happen, it only happens, you know, once or twice every hundred years or something. But this is something that uh, we actually run across quite frequently with my group. 
And so you are also just, you know, a psychic medium and you do, you mentioned the group. So you do work with a paranormal team. How do you work with the paranormal team and what are some of the experiences that you've had? Our team is pretty unique in the way that it is made up mostly of psychic mediums. So normally when it comes to a paranormal investigation team, they will have maybe one psychic on the team. And a lot of paranormal investigation teams are actually very skeptical about psychics because they want everything to be super scientific, all that. That's a whole different story. Our team is, is very unique in the way that most of us are psychics and that's how we work together in tandem. So there will be two to four of us that show up at a house and we then, without speaking to each other, do our walkthrough where we all kind of head off in different directions, feel out the house, make our notes. And then we sit down in front of the client and then tell each other what we felt and sensed and got it. And that's always an interesting experience because you don't know what everybody else got. And so you don't know if you're just the odd one out that didn't pick up anything that they were getting. Um, But more often than not, we're actually all very much on the same page, very much picked up the same things. And then once we kind of explain to each other and to the client what it is that we feel is happening, then we can form a plan. And so my team, we really like to be in and out in about four hours. We like to show up, see what's going on, form a plan and deal with it, and then be done. And we have a huge success rate. I think we've only had maybe two or three cases that have been repeat that we've had to go back um, and do extra work on. So that's kind of the basic flow of it. Now, what I do on the team as a, a cult specialist is if there's anything uh, ritualistic, so a lot of the times I'll be in a home and there's a very particular sort of stink that comes from the occult, dabbling in the occult, things like that. So it's, it's pretty easy to pick up on. And I can also generally tell if it's from the people who are living in the house now or if it was somebody who lived there before. Um, and so my job is to kind of figure out, you know, what were they doing? Were they opening portals? Were they summoning spirits? You know, what, what was happening there? And then kind of give my advice as well as sometimes we'll find things like, they'll be like, oh, we unburied this jar full of like teeth, hair and blood in the backyard. And then that's when our haunting started. So then my job is to deal with that jar or figure out what, how it should be disposed of, um, things like that. On top of that, too, given my background that I had before I joined the team, I am kind of the uh, the resident demon wrangler for the team or uh, what, <laughs> what we're calling demons, you know, negative entities, things like that. So anytime we go in there and there's like human spirits around, you know, my team is pretty much like, yeah, OK, yeah, we got this. But then they're like, however, there is something in a closet in the basement. So we're going to send Josh down there <laughs> to go uh, and see what that is. So a lot of my work revolves around kind of the darker things, the more um, violent creatures that are non-human entities um, is kind of where I specialize in for the group. There's a TV show right there. Four <laughs> psychic mediums, put them in a house and see what matches and see yeah. what the differences are. And I mean, that's just a great idea. Have you have you guys been approached at all about anything like that? Uh, no, we haven't. But there is um, there was something that was on TV. I think there was only like two seasons of it. Do you remember America's Psychic Challenge? I know I've heard of it. I highly doubt I watched it. Oh, I wanted to be on it so bad. I was asked to be on that Psychic Kids show when I was um, in high school. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah, I. Uh, it was so hard because they called me and were like, yeah, we're going to need you there this weekend. And that was the same day I was supposed to be leaving for a trip to Costa Rica that I had spent like two years saving up for. So I was like, no, but like maybe I can be on another one. And then they never called me back. Yeah. But the America Psychic Challenge one was one I always wanted to be on too, but I was way too young. It, they'd be like, you know, here's a parking lot full of cars. <laughs> there is a person in one of these trunks. And then you'd be scored at like how close you got to it or like if you oh, found wow. them or things like that. Was there just like a season of that? I think there was two seasons. There there are some episodes of it on YouTube still. Okay. But they, they would do really neat things too. Like um, they would have like a band set up and then you would have to match the band members with their instrument. Oh, stop it. That's to awesome. see which ones they played. Um, which So they had a bunch of stuff like that. It was scored rather unfairly, in my opinion, but it, it was still a neat idea. When you're watching a show like that, do you find yourself 
participating and scoring yourself. And I, I mean, I know it's produced probably. And so you don't see the whole window of things, but I, I'm sure things start beeping in your head. I mean, I, I love to try and participate in all types of game shows from my couch. I mean, <laughs> me and Jeopardy, it's it's on whenever Jeopardy is on. So definitely I, w- I would attempt to play along, but that was a while ago. So I don't remember if I had anything that was real spot on with it, but they would do things like, um, before we go to commercial, like here are three tennis balls, which one will the dog <laughs> pick? And then when you come back, it shows like which one the dog picked and see if you were right. So I, I do that crap. But <laughs> That's my kind of nerdiness right there, even though I'm not a psychic medium that that fascinates me a lot. Growing up, what kind of paranormal experiences did you have? I don't know when that opened that whole world opened up to you, but what kind of experiences did you have? I had a lot of weird stuff. So for me, there was a definite sort of time in which the psychic thing showed up. I was about seven years old and there was. I want to say a a week or two where I just had a series of migraines every night for a while, like a week, 10 days. And I just remember laying on the ground in my living room crying and my parents trying to give me like, you know, those great chewable Tylenols or whatever that you had (laughs) when you were a kid. And I would take them, but they wouldn't help. Um, And I just remember just crying and crying. And then it stopped. And then after it stopped, I began to have really vivid dreams of places or um, events and then later on come to see them. I was dreaming of the future, which is weird for me because I, to this day, I'm not very good at future stuff. Um, I tend to be more post-cognitive where I I see the past very easily. Um, The the future, short-term future, I can see pretty well, but I definitely tend to be more comfortable in the post-cognitive realm. So that started happening for me. And then as I got a little bit older, the dreaming kind of stopped, but then the dead people showed up, um, which was a very strange experience um, because we lived in a house that was very haunted. And it's it's interesting because, you know, when you're a kid, we moved out of this house when I was probably like 14 or 15. But that's not something that you really talk about. But my sister and I will will get together nowadays and she'll be like, did you think that house was weird? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And then we kind of talk about the things that happened. So like um, there, there was an old woman in the home that would just kind of hang out. She was pretty neat. But we had, and to this day, I'm not really sure what they are. We had some very strange creatures. Um, I don't know how we describe them as kind of being almost like um, goblin-like is what was in there, which was kind of an introduction for me to the fact that there's more on the other side than just dead people. One of the TV shows that, that I do kind of have a love-hate relationship with is the, uh, the, the Dead Files because Amy Allen talks about these other things that are on the other side besides just dead people. There are creatures Mm -hmm. and she's like, I don't know what it is, but it's this weird stick figure thing that's living in the closet. That's just what it is, you know, Uh, (laughs) that's all I got. (laughs) Yeah. That's all I got. So, so that that was a lot of that house growing up was um, being around those spirits. Um, As far as like specific instances, I remember we had this bathtub, we had this, wonderful like antique clawfoot bathtub which I should have totally enjoyed way more than I did because I thought that was standard in all homes come to realize it's definitely not and I won't I want it back (laughs) um but as a little kid I remember one day I was under the water and I decided to open my eyes to look up through it and that was something I had done a million times and I remember this particular time though I I opened my eyes And one of these creatures was looking over the edge of the tub at me. And the only way that I could describe it was that it it was made out of shadow. So it was just kind of like a silhouette. And it looked kind of in shape like a pig in the way that it had. It it looked kind of like a very lumpy pig. And it had like its little hooves over the side. And it had the, the ears that kind of fold over on themselves on top. And it had these two eyes that were just like little stars. They, they, they were small, but they were really bright. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Um, are we talking like cutesy Charlotte's Web, Wilbur the pig, or are we talking like nightmare pig? Like nightmare Wilbur. <laughs> okay. It's, it's very much, yeah, like if we just take that shape, but then turn it into just total darkness. <laughs> um, 
and then just looking at me over the side of it. And I freaked out, just came up out of the water and it was gone. It was absolutely gone. But I remember that so vividly and being really rattled by that for a while. I would think so. I, (laughs) (laughs) I, I want going back to your, your headaches thing. Is there a part of you that wonders if this was like some kind of brain event or like a, a medical event where there's like a, a, a side effect that came out of that where you gain these abilities? You know, like we hear about people who have like car accidents and then all of a sudden they have these abilities or or, mm-hmm. or do you think it was just I, I don't know what what the alternative is, but how how do you work that in your head? I, I've never really considered it so much of a medical event. Um, it's always been in my mind more of a spiritual event because it's not unusual in my family. Um, the, the headaches thing, I, I haven't talked to anybody else in my family and had them be like, that was true for them too. But my family is is very psychically connected and it all kind of manifests differently in each of us. So my mother is an animal communicator. She's a, she's a pet psychic. And then my grandma, her mother, she, according to her, heard the voice of God. So she would say, the heavenly father is telling me to go over here, or the heavenly father is telling me that I need to go do this thing, or the heavenly father wants me to tell you this. And she was generally right. I mean, there, there would be instances too, where she would be like, the heavenly father is telling me to change lanes or, or take a left here. And, and she would, whether she should or shouldn't. <laughs> um, and then there would be like a car wreck where she just was or something like that. So it it seemed to be very legit. So I've always kind of chalked it up to, it was a family thing that was going to be happening to me no matter what. That is just kind of when it decided to download, I guess. Um, My sister is also very psychic, but she didn't, I don't believe that it arrived for her like that either. I, I guess, I don't know. It just really needed to be hard for me for some reason. It sounds like you have a cool family. That was very uh, nurturing and open to the other side and the possibilities of of stuff like this, which is cool. Not everybody mm. has that. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, telling my mom that I thought that I was psychic and I was probably maybe like 11 or 12 and I'll be dating myself here. But um, at first when I told her, she was kind of like, oh, OK. And then the next day she came back and she was like, Hey, I want to show you something real quick. And I'm like, okay. And she had cut out an article from a magazine that was in her hair salon. She, she had owned a hair salon at that point. And it was an article about this brand new show that was about to premiere on TV called medium. And it was an article all about Alison Dubois, the real woman um, and how she saw dead people and spoke to dead people. And she had dreams too. And she used her abilities in order to help solve crimes. And so I remember my mom, I still have the article to this day. I I remember my mom showing this to me and being like, there are others like you out there. You know, she didn't necessarily understand my particular brand of psychic uh, work because I'm one of the few actual kind of mediums in the family, which manifests a little bit different from the other ones. But I just remember her being like, you know, there are other people like you and they're using it to help people. They're doing good things with it. And then so that sort of impacted me a lot at that age. And I've, I've always kind of grown up with this idea that I need to be using this for a purpose that helps people, which has really brought me to do the paranormal work and help people who have, you know, paranormal problems in their homes. Um, I have worked on missing persons cases, but not in any official capacity. Uh, people who are the family of missing people will come to our group a lot and ask us to um, give any insight that we can. So I I haven't worked with law enforcement or anything like that, but I I have assisted where I can in doing that work. So that, that was a big impact for me having her be so supportive like that, but also bring kind of other people into the fold who are like me. That is beautiful. Do you remember the first time you were able to help someone with your ability after that moment where you realized that, you know, helping people was a way you could use your gift? I do think so. There was, at least I remember my first sort of official case that I did. I was 16 because I remember I drove myself there and that was new. 
and I, I went there by myself. It was actually in the, my, my mom worked in a doctor's office at that time and the basement of the doctor's office, cause it, it was like, you know, I am from a small town. So the doctor's office was basically a residential home is what it looked like. And the basement was a very old 1970s apartment that they were going to, the owners were going to be renovating and turning it into a nursery. But some of the people who had worked there were like, I don't know, something's weird. Like when I'm closing up at night, there's something in here with me. I don't know what it is. And like a lot of people had felt it. So during that time, several people knew about my mom doing the pet communication thing. And so they had started coming to her like, Hey, we have haunted homes. Can you fix that too? And she's like, no, but you should talk to my kid. Um, so that's how I kind of ended up on this case in the first place. But I remember going down there and I found something in a closet down there. And at that point I didn't have vocabulary for it. I don't, I didn't know what it was at all. I thought I was going to go down there, talk to, you know, aunt Judy or whoever was haunting it and send her on. But I got down there and I remember just being really pulled towards this closet in the back and I opened it and immediately was just overwhelmed with this awful, terrible feeling of kind of like, um, it it was very much like terror, um, but it was different. It's so hard for me to describe because I'm something that's called um, clairsentient, which means a lot of my psychic feelings come through, um, well, as feelings. And so putting them into words can be very difficult, but I was, I knew exactly what it was. As soon as it hit me, I'm like, oh, this is what some people call demons or or what I now call negative entities. And I've always been a brave and kind of a boneheaded way. So I'm 16 and I'm alone and I'm very inexperienced and I'm like, well, I'll give it a shot. Um, (laughs) ended up luckily actually being able to get this thing out of the basement and they haven't had any problems since, but that was my introduction to this work was going in there by myself and doing that. So that, that was my very first case. Wow. And when I was 16, I was just, you know, making pizzas at Pizza Hut. You know, but <laughs> probably still having the same wonderful effect on people's lives. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, everything has been very abnormal for, for me from the start. Um, when little kids in my neighborhood were putting up signs that are being like, I'll mow your lawn or I'll do a lemonade stand. I'm like five and I'm asking my father how to spell exorcism because that is what I wanted to um, bring to my local neighborhood. And he's like, bro, no, no. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I'm picturing that Lucy stand, you know, when she asks a question or or whatever the it therapist is. Therapist or whatever. The, yeah, yeah, that's funny. Well, oh my gosh, this the time has gone by so fast and we have only like I feel like we've barely had an introduction to J. Allen Cross and I I just need to do some good research and then dig in more. Probably when the book comes out. And I read that. I mean, we definitely need to have you back on the show. And I am curious to know what my listeners, what questions they have now. And so I want to just invite you to to uh, join our big seance parlor on Facebook, because when I host this episode, I'm sure that people will have questions and be curious and want to reach out to you. So do you have any final thoughts? And then uh, just tell us whatever you like what's coming up for you and do some self-promotion here yeah um so right now what we're most looking forward to is the re- is the release of the book um it's coming out may 1st in 2021 so it's just in a few short months here it's coming up very quickly actually it's out for review right now which is very nerve-wracking because they send it out before I've made final edits. <laughs> um, but so it's out for review right now, then it gets sent to the press. It is available for pre-order on Amazon and on bookshop.org. Um, you can pre-order it there, have it shipped to you as soon as it drops on the first. And if you want to get a hold of me, the best way to get a hold of me is through my Instagram. I am at Oregon Woodwitch with underscores in between. Uh, That's the easiest way to keep up to date with everything that's happening and best way to reach out to me. Awesome. Well, I so appreciate you giving us your time and energy 
today, and I look forward to chatting with you again sometime. You rock! (laughs) Thank you, and I would very much like to come back. Awesome. Thank you to the following super paranerds who support the show at patreon.com slash big seance. James Deacon, Melissa Armour, Anne Marie Sullivan, Justin J. Justin, Genesis, Natalie, Kim Robb, Jim Budd, Josiah Lorenzo, Susan Davey, Paula Mitchell, and Amy Park Gedicke. My supporters at the parlor guest level, who can be found at bigseance.com slash parlor guests are Linda of shimmeringmoons.com, Ann Rekovich of ozparatech.com, Jillian Martin, Mindy Kintop, Hope Battaglia, Cassie Keller, Glenna Becker, Diane Rax, Nettie, Dina DeCastro of Dina DeCastro Astrology, Peggy Hagen, Marion Hover Clairvoyant, Bruce Williams, Lana and John of Carbon Lilies, David Rubenstein, and Norman and Linda Keller. That sound you just heard was the above and beyond there's not even a category for your level of support fireworks display. Because I have four awesome listeners who continue to support the show at the $10 level. Steve Skinner, Kevin Gilbert, AJ Meredith, and James Wilfong. So thank you, Steve, Kevin, AJ, and James. And thank you, Paranerds. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit BigSeance.com. You can find and subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and just about anywhere podcasts are found. Do you have any comments or feedback? Go to BigSeance.com slash feedback to learn how to get your voice in a future show. Or you can call my feedback line, 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775-583-5563. Interested in learning how to promote and share the podcast? Go to bigseance.com slash share. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out. But we'll see you and light them again next time. (laughs) 